Hello, and welcome to Office Hours. We're a show dedicated to answering your questions about media and virtual production. We have a fine panel assembled to do that. If you'd like to ask us, ask us a question, uh, you can find out how to ask a question at officehours.global. Uh, typically, we'll spend we'll do that for the first hour, and then the second hour, we'll spend a little time on um, somebody or a certain topic. Saturdays is education hour. So we have with us uh, Dave Trotman today, and he's going to be talking us uh, talking to us about the failure of media literacy. So stay with us uh, for our education hour for that topic. Uh, Ronnie, what do we have today? Thanks, Josh. Our first question coming in from Guy Cochran, Seattle, Washington. What is a cheap way to get NDI into the ATIM? All right, go ahead, Mitchell. The Bird Dog Play 4K is the bargain of the century. If you uh, happen to pop over to the DVE store, uh, you can see it for about, what is it, 190 some dollars, Guy? It's uh, pretty inexpensive and a great way to get NDI into an ATEM or anything else that needs uh, an HDMI in. Guy, do we have the play in stock now? We do. It's been a year. <laughs> so it took a while. And before we were recommending just the Apple TV with the uh, Sienna app, but that's like 249 versus now. With this little thing right here, you can see it is for real. It's just Ethernet, power, and then HDMI out. So then you can pipe that right into your ATEM and you can choose which source on your network that you want. Uh, but yeah, it's a nice way. I was playing with it last night. It's sweet so you, you get a, a ui through a web browser and you can scan your network and pick which ndi source you want so pick up anything from uh, vlc you can use as a playout so i was doing that last night i was just uh, opening up a, a video file in vlc playing it and then you can say output ndi and then pick it up with the bird dog play so you can pick up cameras so that way like this ptz behind me it's NDI. If it's far away, I can send that into a play and into my ATEM. So pretty, pretty cool solution. Nice. And guy, with that interface, does it offer um, any significant advantages over the Sienna app plus uh, Apple? Um, Not that I've seen. I mean, it, it's it's pretty rudimentary. It's it's basically just uh, pick, you can do NDI discovery server, but you can also do that with the uh, Sienna app as well. So that you dig into the menu. Um, I don't think that there's any advantage over, well, I mean, the Apple TV, you got a, a host of apps that you can also use. So that is pretty cool. But these are meant to go like a, a lot of people are using them on the back of monitors. And so say, for instance, you have a house of worship and you want to be able to push the program to another location in the facility. It's a cheap way, maybe uh, monitors in the conference room, nursery, that kind of thing. You can shoot them all around the facility and for 149 bucks, it's not as expensive as it because I have the other uh, decoders that are uh, $400. So to go from 400 to 149 or not tie up a computer, I've seen people tie up, you know, $1,300 laptops <laughs> to, just to convert NDI to HDMI. It's like, you don't have to do that. So the cheapest way would actually, yeah, be to use OBS if you have a spare computer laying around. So you could do it that way as well. OBS can receive an NDI if you decode it and, and then you can just full screen it and take it out. I could see people um, using maybe a stack of those to if they are using an HDMI workflow. Um, do they do they stack uh, well, um, Guy? Do you know? Um, I don't know. Take a. You might want to give there. them some breathing room. I I imagine. It's super light. Like you would be surprised at how light this thing is. It feels like there's nothing in it. It's just. I mean, that's all there is to it. Like you could see my little, my little car. Here's a Matchbox car. Just for reference, because we all know how big a Matchbox is, so that it's a slightly bigger than a Matchbox car, and that's a Lamborghini Aventador. Right. Vroom, vroom. Need a banana license plate. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, fantastic. Wreck. Nigel? Well, you, you got close to my question there, which is, uh, can you have multiple? And if you wanted two or three different signals into your ATEM, say, for instance, out of Zoom ISO, is this the way to do it? Or is there another device that could do that cheaper? Yeah, I was just thinking about that, taking Zoom ISO, bringing it into a meeting and then having all, all my friends around me so I could just put one to each. So yeah, in the decoder app, so you just log in to... So when you hook it up, an IP address will appear across the TV or the screen. So whatever it's outputting, you'll see the URL. You grab that, you put it in, and then in the decodes that says AV setup, NDI decode, 
you choose your source. So all your sources. So if you're connected to Zoom ISO, it'll show up, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So yeah, you could just stack them and you could have, you know, eight, 12, 16, however many NDI pins full screen. So you could, <laughs> could you imagine a stage with like 16 people, but they're all just 70 inch displays, you know, with all your people, that's, that's pretty cool. So you could, yeah, suck them all in with NDI decoders. Nice. Mitchell, do you have something more to add? Yeah, um, just as a, as an alternative, the, it was mentioned uh, Apple TV. You can go to Apple TV. You've got the uh, Sienna app there. Wait, whoop. I don't want to watch Showtime just now. Uh, push the button, then hit the uh, tap the screen, go to your iPhone, and then there you've got a, uh, a TV. But here's the thing. By the time you paid for the Apple TV or recycled it and um, and or bought the Sienna app, and you have your iPhone involved, you spend more money than uh, one of those little play devices. So I think they're the uh, the cat's meow, even if it's the golden cat. Fantastic. It also looks good next to your toy car. Let's go to our next question. <laughs> next question from Craig McFarlane, Boston, Massachusetts. For those with multiple button panels, ATIM Mini and Stream Decks, what is your approach for aligning, angling, and or stacking? Mitchell. Uh, it almost sounds like a fishing question, doesn't it? Um, in my case, uh, I've just got them all lined up. I've got my ATEM here. If I could play notes, I would. Uh, and then it goes into my uh, shuttle, which is in the same angle. And then, unfortunately, uh, the stream deck, which is way over here, uh, does not go in the same plane. So, you know, you just still have to push it and do your little thing. And I'm using mix effects with it. So I have my keyboard down the line, and uh, that works well for me. Nigel. I've done the opposite to Mitch. I've uh, taken my ATEM and moved it all the way over there. So I don't have it on my desk, but I do have two different computers that I talk to. And I have one stream deck with each, and they're on my left and right hand. I've seen these um, pre-built uh, arm pads that make them look like they come from a professional studio. I don't know I can justify something to make my uh, stream decks look pretty, but they do make them look pretty. Yeah, I um I noticed that um, all of the Elgato products they tend to have the same pitch, uh, the leaning value. So having them stacked together, we even looked at the uh, the new Stream Deck that came out. Um, some of those you could pull out, and they're frameable in different interfaces. Uh, go ahead, Mitch. Yeah, the new Stream Deck Plus, uh, uh, Tom Ferguson has one, and John Edelson has one. Um, is a little taller than the. Uh, uh, then the, this little guy over here, you can barely see it, but it comes up to about yay high. So it's about an inch and a half taller, but it's in the same pitch. All right, let's go to our next question. Next question is from uh, Nathan Cashin in Oregon City. Is there a way to get presenter notes from Keynote on a teleprompter? I currently have a pair of teleprompter with the iPhone as an extended display through Duet. Other suggestions to improve eye contact when notes are needed? John. I think your biggest challenge using uh, your iPhone as a teleprompter is that I don't know if there's a way with your iPhone to have your presenter notes show mirrored. And so you're going to struggle if you're using your phone as the, the notes. It almost would be easier to mount your phone like right above your camera or something uh, for a short term fix or get a teleprompter with an external monitor that can be flipped. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a that's a good call out, John. All right, let's go to our next question. Next question from Douglas Carmichael. I'm thinking of getting a Zima board at zimaboard.com as a low power personal NAS host. It has two external SATA connections. Is there any HDD SSD maker that has an external enclosure similar to a USB drive with SATA instead of USB? All right, so the external SATA connectors. Um, I'm not familiar with that one. I remember um, Jason Bay should uh, told us about the Zima board in their what's in our what's in our bag uh, skit but um doesn't look like our our panel uh is familiar with that uh Douglas um ask us again let's go to our next question next question Craig McFarland Boston Massachusetts is there any best or worst time of year cycle for buying link buying AV gear as with other products and he references a lifehacker.com article about the best time to buy anything during the year. Go ahead, Nigel. 
So I normally warn people about, particularly the consumer electronics end of it, TVs and stuff, beware of what you buy out on Black Friday or Cyber Monday uh, and make sure you're really buying what you need because you will see SKUs emerge that are designed for that period of time, particularly in PCs, uh, particularly in things that we, suddenly there are good deals. Either you'll see, um, you know, Best Buy has the 199 PC and if you look carefully, each store has three and so if you're not there particularly early, and they, they often have parts that are, are not the best quality, they failed other things. So be, just beware of buying uh, when you're buying something. Make sure you're buying what you really want, particularly if it's Black Friday or Cyber Monday. Um, you'll find that most other products do have cycles. And as you go up the professional cycle, uh, up the professional product ladder, those cycles are much more dependent to when the product's replaced in the market, when they're cleaning out the channel. So if you're looking for AV stuff, NAB, times like that tend to be when people are moving product. Mitchell? Yeah, I, I agree 100% with what Nigel's saying, and I'm going to throw a few other uh, wild cards out there. Um, after the holidays uh, is a good time to buy because a lot of people have overstock and they're stuck with them. Uh, another one is after NAB, because if we're buying our pro type products, um, ask for B stock and open boxes, things like that. A lot of the stuff that they used uh, on a, on the floor at NAB, they do put up for sale at a substantial discount. Yeah, it seems like um, nowadays with the uh, online retailers, I know Prime Day sort of mid segments the year, and then of course you have the end of the year uh, times to move things out. So. Maybe be cognizant of that. Um, and uh, a lot of those, you do have to, <laughs> I know uh, buying a few things on the last Prime Day, um, there were a couple of great deals and the stock was, it was like a really long time to delivery on some of the like uh, promo products. And then they eventually didn't arrive. So, you know, be careful about the promotional items that you're, you're counting on. Uh, let's go to our next question. Next question is Douglas Carmichael. I've been experimenting with Grafana, grafana.com, as an observability tool to monitor my personal virtual server. Could you see observability or monitoring tools from the IT world being useful in our industry? Let's see. Um, looks like a, an interesting uh, dashboard. Um, I don't see any of our panel uh, weighing in on this. Douglas? Oh, here's Ronnie. Yeah, Douglas, I've, uh, I, I've, I've, Attempted to set up Grafana uh, f f just to play with it because it seems like really cool, and obviously you can get a whole lot of information. So, for example, if you're running uh, if you're running servers on AWS, you'd be able to pull in information from there. If you uh, you can you can take a look at your uh, networking equipment and constantly be monitoring that. So, I think it would be extremely useful, uh, and I will I will be sure to let you know if I get it up and, and running. So. But yeah, Grafana.com would have uh, some examples of what you can do, but it's extremely popular in the IT world, fully customizable as to what you want to monitor. Put it on a big TV in your office and look really, really cool. <laughs> yeah, it does look nice. All right, let's go to our next question. Next question from Mitchell Hill in Wilmington, Delaware, and here on the panel. What is an easy way to restart your stream deck when it freezes? Not if. Uh, when? <laughs> Nigel? I have a three-stage process. I restart the software, I unplug the device, I reboot my Mac. And uh, one of those three, depending what the problem is, will make it work. And I am not patient enough to do anything else. Mitchell, how do you feel about the current recommendation? Uh, I think those are good uh, good suggestions. The only thing, if you're unplugging the USB on it, um, don't do it while it's powered up. It's not a good idea to do that. Uh, some people just you know make it make it a point but just a small safety tip there. Um, the other thing I found, um, sometimes if it freezes uh, and I'm running Companion, if I uh, stop and then start Companion, it will sometimes uh, get it back up. But there's no on-off switch on it, so there's no easy way to uh, get it into a, you know, a restart phase. I, um, I admit, Mitchell, that I am unrepentant about unplugging the Stream Deck when frozen when it's plugged in. In fact, um, depending on the model you have, so with the XL, it has the USB into the back. So rather than crawling where I'd have to crawl to, to unplug it otherwise, it is more convenient for the 
um, for the ones that have the USB delivered to the device itself and removable. Um, not all devices do. I know the earlier ones didn't. I think the refresh ones, they had the cord attached. And I can't remember can't remember if the new one, if it's attached or not. Oh, no, it is. It's at the top, right? The, the new one with the knobs goes in the top of the Stream Deck. Uh, Mitchell, more to add? Yeah, Josh, I'd be careful. Uh, if you do that while it's hot, uh, you may find your uh, monitor looking like Ronnie's does when he comes on to read. That's okay. Uh, I know an electrician. Let's go to our next question. Uh, next question comes from Mike Beardmore in Reading, UK. Are there any new features in the latest keynote worth noting? John. Almost all the new features in October were collaboration. A lot of it had to do with the new OS features that let you share documents more easily, including through like messages and stuff. You can see when people made changes a little easier. I don't use collaboration tools on uh, Mac software, so I wouldn't, I haven't tried it out. I think there's also one change to, you can now remove background in video as well as audio, or I'm sorry, as well as images instead of just images. Gotcha. Are any, uh, John, do you know that if any of those updates are operating system dependent? I believe when they had um, one of the camera features, I believe there was an operating system requirement for some of those. I, I suspect so, just because so much of the new technology this year um, with whatever the new Mac OS is, is about those collaboration with that new whiteboard tool. But I haven't tested it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and um, before we go to our next question, if you have more questions, we have a great panel this morning, lots of experts, feel free to drop one in. Um, otherwise, we'll just, we'll just dwell a little bit on the, the questions that we have. Let's go to our next question. Next question, Conrad Marshall, coming to us from Atlanta, Georgia. Any tips for economical tally lights or for the host looking at the right camera in a multi-cam broadcast? All right, Mark, want to start us off? Oh, I think you're, I think you're muted there, Mark. Sorry about that. Scarhoy makes a little system that runs as a switcher kind of device that runs Ethernet back and forth through tally lights that you can place right on top of your cameras. Not inexpensive. Nice. Guy? That's the expensive one. If, if you're using a NDI with some of the PTZ cameras, uh, like Bird Dog, it has a, they call it the Mohawk. It, um, so it's right there. There's a tally light on the, on the top of it. And, uh, a lot of the other ones have that as well. Um, some of the other options are, uh, AV matrix makes a wireless, uh, tally system. So it looks like this, and these are again, wireless. So you can mount them on top of your, your camera, but all in all, that's, um, about three ninety nine for the, for, uh, the main brain. And then if you wanted like a pack of six of these things, I saw them on eBay, you can pick them up for 549 to get six tallies. Uh, the other option would be if you're using vMix, there is, you can use a phone. And basically if you have an old phone or iPad laying around 99 cents, you can get the unofficial vMix tally lamp. And then that way you can put those, uh, phones or cameras above the, or phones or, um, iPads above the camera and have them light up blue or green or red or hot. And then the other one is QB, uh, that's C-U-E-B-I. And these are some uh, uh, little tally systems that work with uh, some of the bigger players out there, uh, Blackmagic, Roland, uh, and you can see those being uh, used at different venues. So QB, I'll put the link in the uh, chat. Thanks for that. You know what, the, uh, the tally lamp, I was not aware of the vMix tally lamp. Do you know, Guy, if it's possible to use that as a contributing camera and have the tally app run on no, the device. No, it's just an well, it's just an app, so it's running. I don't think you could have two at the same time. So it's either a camera, or it's the tally, because it's going to take over the screen. It's just making the screen red or or um, or green. But could you use the camera of it with the tally on? I wonder. Mm, I don't it's, think it's so. I mean, you, okay. could give, you mean like run the NDI camera? Yeah, because it would take over the NDI camera would take over the screen. So the screen of it. Sure. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Uh, Mitchell. Yeah, some of those uh, uh, suggestions are excellent. Uh, actually, all of them are. But uh, I, I really like the Scarhoy, but I didn't like the price. But uh, the larger device the guy showed, I hope he puts the uh, link to that in event chat because I thought that was really cool. 
I think it was the second one you showed, Guy. But there's a lot of different ways to get about uh, having a uh, tally light. And the question is, what's going to trigger it? Your uh, your microphone being turned on, uh, Zoom, uh, whatever. And there are a lot of ways you can build your own, um, if you don't mind working with a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. Um, I believe we had a lab here once, how to put a, uh, how to build a tally light for a pizza box or something like that. Just make sure you order a small pizza. Yeah, um, that's a that's a good point, uh, Mitchell. Um, Mickey uh, uh, talks about in the chat just having a device with the GPO port. Uh, you can make one with uh, you know power supply, some LEDs, and, and an Arduino. You know, and, and oftentimes I know when we talk about the best solutions, oftentimes we tend to you know use premium uh, suggestions. But if someone asks for budget, I wonder if they're not counting their time budget. You know, you could uh, delve into MakerBit. I believe was the the lab that we did uh, to make those as well. Uh, Mitchell, more to add? Yeah, I was going to say you can get a uh, you need that contact closure. Um, for example, my uh, 205, not showing it off, folks, just letting you know I have it. Um, and you already knew that um, has a, uh, a little uh, spot on the back that you can uh, you can get a contact closure off it right there. And then you would run it into uh, a device that allows you to switch uh, power or uh, relays. And uh, the uh, one we use in the broadcast industry is made by a company called Henry. They have a thing called a Super Relay. They have a Super Relay 2. And I tried the Super Relay uh, with my on-the-air light there, and it doesn't like uh, reactive loads. In other words, you can't switch a uh, neon transformer with the switch because it's using, I think, like what they call an SCR, uh, the switch. It's not a straight-up relay that's switching that. So be careful um, if you're trying to switch re, uh, on air lights and things like that, um, you need different ways. And then if you're a broadcaster, um, when you usually turn your microphone on, and I'll just uh, simulate that, watch over my head. Woo! That's using a super relay. So I've got on air lights all over the place. Nice. And um, Bo uh, Cordell mentions in the chat as well that um, Tally Arbiter running a Raspberry Pi. Um, can set up tally for you. It'll uh, output to a web page. Thanks for that tip, Bo. Uh, let's go to our next question from Bo. Next question from Bo Cordell, Charleston, South Carolina. Continuing the discussion of mini PCs, the Rock 5 Model B, priced between $150 to $200, has an HDMI input. Could this be an inexpensive way to get HDMI feeds to NDI or Zoom? Okay. Um, Thanks, Bo, for being a uh, contributing member today. So um, looks good. Rock 5B, 150 to 200. Um, I don't have the specs up on that now. I don't know if our panelists got a chance to check that out. Um, Guy, were you able to to pin that one down? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's uh, still on pre-order. It looks like it does indeed have an HDMI input uh, Linux. So... I mean, if you're a, uh, a Linux person, this may be an answer to being able to run something like uh, decaffeine, but decaffeine is only 720p. So, like, the, so this is this would be for an encode. I'm not sure what the cheapest encoder uh, NDI to HDMI would be. They're, they're still kind of pricey. So, uh, it looks cool. Uh, I'll have to maybe. I don't know. I don't know if I'll buy one of these or not. <laughs> it looks cool, though. I'm not sure if anyone has them. So if anyone has put an order on them, uh, let us know uh, if that's a viable alternative to some of the other uh, things. Maybe we'll tell Courtney about it. Let's go to our next question. Well, the, ne the next question is, is uh, looks like it's addressed to Alex about the Gray Matter show and looking for, uh, looking for photos of behind the scenes. So... Is that something we're able to do, or should we uh, push that back? Well, we'll go ahead and ask the question, and um, all right. That way, so people is, that are watching might be able to 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 answer that. Alex is not with us today, but they they can't read uh, they can't read my mind of the question without the reader reading the question. Is that what you're depends saying? Depends on how close they are. <laughs> James James Babbitt from San Diego, California. Hi, Alex. Great show on gray matter with Michael Krasny, and I uh, apologize on that name, Nipan Meta. Could you show a behind-the-scenes photo of the setup? Okay, so there we go. We have one request for a behind-the-scenes. Um, and um, 
ask again, uh, James, when, when Alex is on, just in case he doesn't uh, fall back and, and get that request. All right, let's go to our next question. All right. Mike Beardmore again, Reading, UK. Are there any new features in the latest GarageBand worth noting? All right. Um, got the new got the new set for Apple. Has anyone been able to to open up the, the GarageBand app on Apple? I have to admit that's one place I haven't uh haven't been able to do uh, a lot with on the Mac. I've opened it up a little bit on the iPad. Uh, I'm assuming that this is the the new Mac version of it, or did they release one for the iPad too? I actually don't know. Well, um, sorry, Mike, uh, we can't alert you to any new features, but um, we'll be on the lookout. Let's go to our next question. Next question from Frank Kenny in Ottawa. Can you use Zoom OSC with an SSO or single sign-on login? I'm going to go on a limb and say you used to not be able to. <laughs> I don't know if that has changed. Um, to be honest, there was some discussion that we've had um, just yesterday. We had our uh, our Zoom ISO lab and uh, Jonathan Cocatello came in. This would have been a fantastic uh, question from him. Um, we've been having, I don't know if we'll be um, having them next week or not, or what the the scheduling for them. But we've we've been kind of privileged for a while. We've had the uh, the attention of Andy and Jonathan came in and talked to us, uh, answered all of our questions about Zoom. Um, he was um, you know intricate in planning Zoomtopia, so we plied him with uh, the questions about the behind the scenes uh, and other places. So um, unfortunately, um, that's a good question to to send to them. Uh, you'll have to do do a little bit of research, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, it would have been a good question to ask Jonathan yesterday. Let's go to our next question. Next question, Craig McFarlane, Boston, Massachusetts. Has anyone used StreamYard's new feature to record video locally at each guest's computer? It seems handy for post-recording cleanup. Nice. That's uh, another solution for people. StreamYard is really bringing a lot of uh, a lot of features. I know that uh, a lot of folks that have been doing their own custom production have been challenged a bit. They've really raised the bar. I didn't know the StreamYard now end or ends um, offers end end to end. I forget what they call that uh, feature. End to end recording, but um, that is fantastic. I know that there was a few apps that we used that. We, we were having some issues with it. The idea is that you can have a conversation that doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the highest quality, but a local recording is always the best. So it's a fantastic feature. Um, if anyone uh, has some experience in using that, um, let us know. But thanks for the heads up that, that that feature exists. We'll have to check that out. Let's go to our next question. Next question is uh, Shirag Jira, Dallas, Texas. Looking at the Atmos range of products and looking for a multi-cam recorder, which do you recommend? Mitchell? Yeah, uh, the question should be Atomos, but uh, not your problem. Um, I, th I thought that sounded funny in my yeah, head. Yeah, it is Atomos. That's the name of the company. Um, Atomos uh, has a Shogun, and they just updated it. It's amazing what it can do. I don't know what it can't do is probably the best way to explain it, so... Maybe Guy has more on it, but it's uh, it's a new iteration of that very popular recorder. Guy? Yeah, I guess it depends on how many channels he's looking for. I was just looking at the the specs of the new Shogun 7, $1,299. It does have uh, SDI and HDMI inputs, but it looks like it's only two channel from what I can tell on the, on the specs. The one that uh, we've had good success with is actually from another manufacturer it is the uh, AJA KeyPro Go which is a four channel uh, recorder. This one will allow you to record a ProRes and you can see that there's USB inputs on the front, but this this gives you four discrete uh, 1080s uh, in, a, in a nice format. You can see that there's SDI inputs, uh, HDMI uh, inputs as well. So this is one of the few devices that allow you to do that. I'd say take a look at that or, you know, good old ATEM ISO Extreme will record four as well. So that might be an alternative to drop in 4,000 bucks on one of the key pro goes. Nice. I think uh, Mickey arrived the same place in the chat. He mentioned you might want to go with separate recorders. 
uh, for multi-chat. All right, let's go to our next question. Next question from Chad Lafarge in Columbia. With Black Friday fast approaching, what are the gear deals you think we should have our eyes on? What are you excited to buy? Nigel, have you been shopping? So I've discovered on Black Friday, everything I want to buy is not available for sale. And so that's part of part of the trick. Again, uh, as we talked about a bit earlier, Black Friday is the great time to buy lower end uh, consumer electronics products that you uh, don't particularly care about. Yeah, so a cheap TV, a cheap uh, technology, you're not going to find the high end. I think Cyber Monday offers some interesting opportunities uh, with software going on sale and particularly uh, companies we know who will put uh, a piece of software out at a, at a huge discount. If I had a wish list, uh, it would probably be the you know a new ATEM ISO, um, which probably won't be on much discount. It would be things like that. So I, I tend to keep focused on do i need a new television somewhere is there some piece of consumer electronics or some piece of software that uh, might have a one-time fire sale mitchell yeah nigel's right there's a lot of low-hanging fruit around black friday uh they're more interested in attracting people with low prices they aren't necessarily the best devices um and uh, you might end up getting something that you don't like uh just because the price was low um, and I don't go to Costco to get my ATEM uh, ISO. So uh, you got to know where you're looking for. John. I myself will be seeing if there's any deals on the new Apple TV 4K. And uh, that's something that I want to upgrade in my living room. Harshi. If anybody is interested in some interfaces, Sweetwater has some pretty interesting deals. Uh, the SSL 2 Plus is uh, dropped down from 299 to 229 and so if anyone's looking for a clean interface uh, there you go sweet water all right and you know we have uh, a few different uh discord channels uh that i'm sure people will be advertising you know some of the uh, the deals to get for the media professional uh or for you uh let's go to our next question next question is from salok lopez waterman does anyone have experience with TC1 from Deity? It's a time code solution. Do you have any opinions? And he has a link there to Guy's DVE store and the product. Mitchell? I'm sorry, Tolark. I do, I do not have experience with it, but I thought I'd chime in here. But I do recall it uh, being showed, I think it was Cinegear or an AB. I think it was Cinegear. We saw the uh, owner of Deity uh, talking it up. And uh, it's nice because up till that time, uh, by the way, we're talking about a uh, time code slate you know, like that. And it has time code built into it. Um, I guess the Denicki or however you like to pronounce it, Denicki, um, has been the uh, industry standard for doing uh, slates with uh, time code on them. Uh, but this, uh, this one looks like uh, it's pretty interesting, as I recall from the, uh, the interview. And um, it's cheaper. So there you go. Nice. I, I think I remember um, Senegar. Didn't we uh, stop by the booth and, and see that one? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was talking about. The uh, owner, president. Yeah. Excellent. All right, let's go to our next question. Next question from Nathan Cash in Oregon City. In Felipe's Inside the Show Masterclass this week, he mentioned that you can't show multiple cameras simultaneously through an ATIM. Is this correct? What's an alternative to show multiple camera angles through OBS or Ecamm? Right. Um... Go ahead, Guy. I mean, it depends on which ATEM you're talking about. Of course, with the extremes, you got super source, so you can you can show a couple uh, cameras with the super sources. Uh, with the one you, with a normal one, you can do a picture in a picture, so you can have at least a second one. And with a downstream key, I think you might be able to get three on screen. But yeah, so that wouldn't be an exactly a true statement. It just depends on what you want to see. But you could at least do two side by side for sure, or however you want, big, small. But you could totally position it wherever you want. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, the strength of the ATEM is a one, uh, a many to one uh, general, but as Guy mentioned, you know, however many outputs you have, you might be able to select those. Um, and using them through, there, through OBS, you can select different outputs. You can put as many projection outputs as your computer can support. Um, so do some testing, but it is kind of fantastic. Any one of your scenes can be an output, which, which you can send to a screen, which oftentimes 
uh, some folks here are using as an input into ATEMS uh, for processes that OBS is good at pulling down and then putting out onto a different screen. Uh, let's go to our next question. Next question from Nigel Dussault here on our panel, Austin, Texas. If we compare Bird Dog Play 4K NDI Player and Sienna app on Apple TV into the ATEM, are there video sync or delay problems caused by processing? Go ahead, Nigel. Yeah, so I was listening to the conversation. Guy uh, introduced that Bird Dog device, and then Mitch talked about the Sienna piece of software. And, you know, I'm, I'm wrestling with trying to decide whether I want to go the SDI way uh, to use Zoom ISO and whether I'm going to buy, you know, all of that with the deck link card and all of that. And and it's hard to stare at something less than about $5,000 for doing that physically because there's so much, for me at least, there's so much change. So I'm, I'm sitting here thinking I have a box of old Apple TVs, assuming they run the Sienna interface, or if I got, you know, two or three of those uh, those bird dog things, I could sort of simulate a lower end version of that using NDI. And then I thought, okay, wait a minute. If I, the moment I use Apple TVs, am I going to introduce delay? Am I going to introduce sync problems? So, so what might the issues be with, you know, building the, the poor man's version of that system rather than going with the SDI approach? Good points. Mitchell? Well, uh, Nigel, as you well know, the anything that goes into the ATEM is going to get resunk, as it were, resynced, if you if the proper pronunciation. Um, I notice with my Sienna app that there is a bit of a delay there because it's going. But I'm then again, I'm using my phone, uh, not a regular NDI uh, source. So the more devices it's got to run through, it seems to me the more uh, delay you're going to get because you've got to go through an Apple TV and then into a piece of software and then out to your uh, ATEM. So there's bound to be something, uh, perhaps, and I don't know for sure, uh, the play is going to uh, be a little bit uh, easier on the latency. But Guy probably knows more. Go, Guy. Yeah, if I would have had just a few more minutes, uh, I could have actually pulled up uh, the Apple TV as well. But this is the bird dog play. So you can see the delay that's happening here. So you can see that's the... The, the smaller box is the one that is the bird dog play. And you, there's actually a lot of delay. That, so that's bird dog. Oh man, this is a lot going on here. Uh, let's see, camera into a bird dog encoder. Actually, this is going to confuse you guys. Basically, it's camera into um, an NDI encoder, then uh, onto the network, the bird dog play picks it up and then puts it... Uh, into an ATEM and then it's going into Vmix. This is actually a lot, a lot of stuff going on right here. Nobody, I don't think anybody would do this, but I'll try it, uh, Nigel. I'll try hooking them up side by side and that way it'll be a fair test. Right now, this is kind of a mess. So how I've got it going in, it's not a fair representation. Fantastic. <laughs> That's uh, quite almost. We could have we just needed to deliberate just a little bit longer for our, for our demo to, to fall in. I wonder... Um, not all Apple TVs are created equal. I wonder if some of the newer ones with higher processing power might be helpful. Less economical, of course, but um, I know that um, what you need for the Apple TV is a um, is an Apple TV that's capable of running apps. So any of the 4K uh, version model ones will do that. Um, the third generation HD was the last one that could not uh, run apps. So if you have a version three, um, congratulations, but you won't you won't be able to use it for that. So, and I know the the latest one that was just released had significant uh, horsepower. So I don't know how much the processing uh, power of that box. So I'm wondering if the Apple TV would be interested to know uh, the different models, um, if any of them have better performance than the other, or if it's maybe that's not the limiting factor. Um, Nigel, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm assuming the Apple TV uh, needs to be on Ethernet, not on, on Wi-Fi. So then the question is, what is the amount of processing going on in the Apple TV and the Sienna app versus the standalone, you know, box? Because sometimes the standalone box can be much, you know, lower amounts of code. They can m run much tighter. Whereas will the Apple operating system well, however much add in the overhead. I guess that will come down to the question. 
Copy that. Yeah, if, it, if there was an ASIC, that might uh, that might throw it in the favor of the purpose-built device. Mitchell? Yeah, it's uh, it's enough of the de- delay with the Apple TV to to get feedback from it. That repeating feedback it goes wow, 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 and it gets louder and louder. Do that again if you want. But um, I like the idea of an Apple TV because we all have a few of those lying around. And wouldn't that be nice just to be able to buy a piece of software, plug your uh, your Apple TV into your ATEM, and you're off and running. But you've got you got to buy the software too, and that's about ninety nine bucks. And guy. Yeah, so I'll just show you guys behind the scenes what the uh, interface looks like. So here's the web UI. You can see it's got an IP address of 192.168.1.173. I'm logged into it. You can see the CPU usage on a 4K sing- signal. So this is a, um, what is this? This is a Zcam camera doing 4K HDMI out that goes into another BirdDog encoder. So we're we're kicking it into 4k so you can see 3840 by 2160 the cpu usage is at 82 percent network bandwidth it's hardwired um, both units are hardwired so the encoder and the decoder see we're doing um rudp so that's the network mode uh 29.97 48 kilohertz audio 422 and uh, network speeds thousand megabits on this line and then here's in the um, av setup to choose uh, the different devices on the network. You can see this is where you would choose your your um, your device off the network. And then you could even have a failover source in case uh, that camera or whatever goes down. You can have a failover somewhere else. And then you can also see that there is um, where, oh yeah, it's under network for where you can choose the uh, discovery server. So there's the discovery server IP address. So Pretty cool interface um, that, you know, anywhere on your network, you could log into the same with Sienna. So with the Apple TV Sienna, it does give you an IP address for your Apple TV. And it's like uh, the IP address followed by 8088 uh, colon 8088. And that'll get you into a similar UI like this. But this is pretty slick for what it is. Uh, I'm pretty impressed with how it all looks. And Guy, you've used both uh, that and the Apple TV. Would the yeah, web interface it. be? I have it around the corner. It's just, um, yeah, I can't get I'm locked down with my ears and everything. And otherwise I would have ran and hooked it up. But yeah, it's it's a similar interface. Uh, it doesn't look as elegant as this one, but it's still, it's functionality. It's the same. But I mean, again, it's impressive that you can pull 4K uh, over a network and convert it to HDMI just without without having to run an HDMI cable if you don't want to, especially for house of worship. Again, that example is, uh, or a school or a corporate office. So as long as uh, there's nothing that's going to mess up your stream, it's a good solution. Yeah. I'm wondering if remoting into that interface is a boon for the play over the Apple TV. Yeah, there. I'm not familiar with the API, but uh, some people that bought 50 of these things all at once, because we're almost out. Like if you go to some of the big players and they don't have any, we have like 20 left and some people bought 50 at once and they're, they're putting them all like, think about like a, a casino where they need to have all these different feeds and they need to be able to select those feeds and route them. It's very easy with a NDI network. So it's, and then multicast being able to say, I want this on 10 TVs. So it's a, it's a, a cool infrastructure. I mean, instead of running a bunch of new cable, you can use the existing cable. So act now if you want. <laughs> act now. <laughs> good. good, Mark. So, Guy, in that interface that you just showed, it it said that the internet or the bandwidth was thirty three percent. So, is that yeah. mean that on a one gig network you'd only want two four K devices before um, you start to overload the one gig network? Possibly. So. You're getting, yeah, about uh, 240 um, megabits on a 4K tw- uh, 2160p stream. So, yeah, you can eat through it pretty fast if you're doing full 4K. But that's full NDI. I mean, there's encoders that will also kick out NDI HX, which is much more efficient, but there's going to be a little bit more lag. And for this, it doesn't matter because your CPU usage is on the box. It's not like you're tying up another computer, hitting it harder. And that's the beauty of these things is you just let them do the decoding. So you could send a highly efficient NDIHX uh, streams. And forgive me if I, if you didn't mention it, if you already mentioned it, Guy, but you did say NDIHX supported on the play. Mm -hmm. It is. Okay. Nigel. 
Yeah, what's the pricing on the Sienna thing? I thought I saw it was like nine dollars, and I just heard ninety no, nine. No, nine ninety nine. Oh, so okay. ninety nine plus the one sixty nine for your Apple TV. So you're in it, you know, two sixty nine. So you get more functionality. So the Sienna is ninety nine dollars. Yes, but you can install it on as many uh, Apple TVs as you'd like. So that is kind of a boon. There is that you can uh, put it on multiple. You don't have to pay for it every single time. Yeah, same uh, same account. You can keep those going. And th- th- I want to say, does the Apple TV support NDI HX? I'm uh, sure. I'm pretty it does. sure it does. Man, you're making me want to go. Actually, I can probably find <laughs> it on my network. I'm thinking like that might be a that might be a, a reason. I remember when I looked at it, um, I had, had it reserved for a while. Um, I remember seeing the NDI HX, and I haven't got a chance to play with it. So if anyone knows about the Apple TV in HX, interested. Nigel? No, you answered my question. Um, I'm trying to find if this runs on my iPads, because I can't find. I guess I'm going to have to check my Apple TV. Okay, uh, let's go to Mitchell. Um, can you route that over the public internet, or do you need a uh, VPN to make that work? Uh, that is, it's NDI, uh, so it hooks into your Ethernet port. It's the same same stipulations of running NDI. You know, you can run it uh, in with the the, the crowd. Uh, some best practices are, you know, as far as best proct- best practices of running NDI apply. So well, you, you um, can port for. You can port yeah, forward, ahead. Mitch, if that's what you mean. If if you want to, yeah, hit that. You would just you would say that this IP address of this device uh, port forwarded through your router, and you'd be able to hit it from the outside. Gotcha. And Ronnie. All right. So uh, I do have the Apple TV behind me here, and uh, and uh, so this is this is the screen here for the uh, in the Sienna NDI Apple TV app. Uh, you can see I do have my phone here, so we'll hit that, hit save, and now there's NDI HX coming through on the Apple TV, um, just to demonstrate the delay there. Right, and we're still seeing your, think, we're yeah, still you're right, seeing I was just thinking interface. that. Interface. <laughs> I was just thinking that, I was I was moving my fingers and I'm like, wait a sec. I'm the only person who can see this. All right, sorry. That's not fair. <laughs> the only person who can see this is me. You're welcome, everyone. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll... Uh, there you go. There's the mess. There's the mess. So anyway, this is NDIHX. Um, you can see. See the delay there? Pretty quick. It is pretty fast, yeah. The Apple TV I found to be pretty quick. But yeah, this is NDI HX to the Sienna app on an Apple TV, and it is not the 4K model. So, fantastic! All right, so only only better results for for larger end days, and it, that is a that is a boon with the Apple TVs as far as scale. Um, one um, Apple account is all you need to purchase the license for. So, just depending on the the price of the Apple TVs. Now let's go to our next question. All right. Next question, Douglas Carmichael again. In the OH space or office hours space audio control area, there was a bird dog flex 4k on the display screens. What is that device and how would it be used? Yeah, that one's a little pricier. Um, that was the one that I looked at with that really made the, uh, the Sienna app look great because it's, um, about 400, a little over $400, I believe. Um, I believe it's the same functionality, um, but uh, I don't know if we know specifically what the the difference is um, with the uh, with the play. Um, did we say the play also does uh, 4K or is it just HD for the play? It's 4K. the The flex is an encoder, so you can you can go uh, you know in, and then the play is a decoder. So yeah, the oh, okay. the flex. Um, yeah, it is either an in or it's an out. So an encoder or a decoder. Um, that's so how it's used. It just depends on the workflow. Do you need to kick something in or kick something out? Okay, there we go. Uh, let's go to our next question. Next question, Douglas Carmichael again. It was said that subtle communication cues don't as easily translate to a virtual space. 
For those on the autism spectrum, could you see advantages to virtual slash remote working despite its disadvantages? Dave? That is a really interesting question for me, and I kind of feel like, yeah, the virtual uh, has some advantages for people who have difficulty sharing a room with people. Um, you know, a common physical space is useful for corporations and that to get the message across to everybody all at once and have all the emotion attached to why those sales numbers are terrible. Um, and and then you have the um, common appearance. Everybody wears the same thing and there's no accounting for, you know, options in the business world you try to conform. But working from home means that you can be more comfortable in, in clothing that you're you're happier with. Um, I guess it's a more formal conversation online and that kind of benefits people who have difficulty following conversations, uh, people with dyslexia trying to read PowerPoint uh, slides and then they go by too fast in a real meeting mm -hmm. and, uh, on zoom, they go by a little slower, but of course they can also be fuzzier. Um, the option not to have video, you know, if your workplace allows you to log in and just listen that's always nice because then you're not distracted by what's going on behind people. And that, that common workspace, of course, is now individualized for anybody who's on camera is, uh, we're all sort of interested in what's going on in the background. So, um, it, it might be a little harder for someone on the spectrum to pay attention to what a person is saying if the image is too interesting. And, uh, the fidgeting can be invisible. A person can be allowed to fidget terribly and not really appear to be distracted or not paying attention. So those are my first impressions of the advantages of a virtual world. John. I agree with Dave. I think it really depends on the individual and the same individual with who might have struggle in the social arena, for example, in a workplace might be seen as distracting or uh, violating social norms and working virtually that might really help them. On the other hand, if they're in a virtual meeting, if they can't see the uh, nonverbal cues they would normally look for in a person to interpret the other person's uh, response, they might really struggle. So it depends on the person and it depends on their manager. Because if I'm in a virtual meeting, one thing I really like to do is send a direct message to someone who's speaking on my team and saying, hey, you're rambling, for example, as long as I know it's not going to show up on their screen if they're sharing their screen. And so I can coach people in a different way that's more immediate virtually. So. It really depends on the person and situation. And Nigel? My only add to that is I know the, the spectrum is very bright, very broad. And um, I think it's important that people uh, get to learn to be around people on the spectrum and understand them. And if you're locked in your virtual world where well, that will make you more comfortable as someone with autism, it doesn't necessarily help those that don't have the experience of working with people with autism understand what life is like for them. And I would worry that the person who was remote in a meeting, particularly if it was a hybrid meeting, would become ignored or excluded from the conversation. Because the moment multiple people are gathered in the room, then the conversation will happen between them and not with the person virtually coming in. New wild, uh, new wild world out there to all types of different uh, uh, experiences we have nowadays. Let's go to our next question. Next question, Craig McFarland, Boston, Massachusetts. Using in-ear monitors over a workday, do you just pop them in or out or do you disconnect the cable or angry audio disconnector, which he has a link and I clicked and it looks really, really, really cool. All right, well, we'll uh, move through this a little quickly to get to our EDU, but go ahead, Dave. Well, I'm gonna probably sound like a pitch man for aftershocks, but after I've started wearing those instead of anything in my ears, um, I've actually, walked away from my work after finishing a day of meetings and forget that I have them on. So that's how comfortable they are and how effective they are for communication. And uh, in-ear used to be a, a treat, a, a pressure on my ears, a, a pulling on them. And uh, after many hours of working on the computer and being in meetings, I would have aching ears. So that's the difference I can feel. Mitchell, did Catfish send you one of those? Uh, yeah, he did. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll unplug it. I can't show it to you as I unplug it, but I can. And there it is. It's just a little magnetic thing that uh, plugs into the other device. The only problem is, is on my Aeron chair here, the cable inevitably gets wrapped around the arm. And when I stand up, it rips them out of my head. So I'm not a big fan of wearing them all the time. I like headphones. And Nigel. 
Yes, uh, ditto what uh, Mitchell said. Uh, during office hours, I tend to use Road Pros uh, with two packs so I can get up and walk around and get a cup of coffee and do things like that. But during my work day, I use in ear in ear monitors also with uh, the fabulous snap connector. But what I've discovered, because I have the underslung arm, um, I can use a magnetic clip that I store from the kitchen. I attach it like that and it's on the arm, and that way it doesn't get wrapped around my seat so much. Nice hack. Let's go to our next question. I want to go to the kitchen right now and steal one. Douglas Carmichael, the Troubadour, an L.A. concert venue, charges $15 per channel to record a show. Considering the front of house console has a built-in USB interface, why could they do that? John? They can do that because people are willing to pay for it. Simple market dynamics, right? Uh, supply and demand. Let's go to our last question. Last question. Kevin Graham, Rochester, New York. Has anyone been able to get three Insta360 links to work on one multicam session? I know that some of us have two. Has anyone been privileged enough to have a third? I, and I've not seen the interface, if anyone knows whether it seems to have a placeholder for the, the other cameras that Alex seemed to indicate that his was. But I don't think any of us have... Oh, Guy might know. Guy, have you... I haven't, I haven't tried it, but I'm interested in trying it with the uh, beta VMix 26 because the first thing they call out in the beta is Insta360 compatibility for multi-camera. So I'd imagine that they're, they're hot on that because if, if you can get these long USB cables, these extension cables that are either fiber, they're, they're not cheap. They're, they can be uh, over a hundred dollars, but now think about getting these little tiny, you know, $300 cameras in a venue wherever you want. So um, they can replace with that half inch chip. I mean, they can replace some of these more expensive traditional cameras, but they just don't have the zoom reach. So I'm, I'm really interested in, in this as well, but I'm, I'm almost positive that you'd be able to do it. Alex has done it with two, uh, just locally on his machine and they both appear in, uh, in whatever, um, interface that you're pulling them in. So, but you can see them with discrete numbers in the, uh, Insta360 app. You can see, uh, the different models and click on them. All right. Thank you uh, for our panel, for uh, being our, our experts and answering our questions. Thank you for our producers uh, for that first part of our show, uh, providing us with uh, the, the questions that you want to ask. And thank you for our crew as well. You'll see a list of credits um, later in the show. Uh, with those that have been helping out behind the scenes. But the show's not over yet. We're going to transition now to our education hour. And Dave, I believe you're hosting. Um, what do you have for us today? Well, in the 1980s, the idea we could educate our children to be aware of media manipulation through a course called Media Literacy, uh, if it was added to the education curriculum, and it was a wildly popular idea. But where is it today, and did it miss the mark? So that's what we'll be looking at today in the Education Hour. You can all stay with us if you want to hear about that. After we get everyone into the chairs, we'll be right back. Good morning, Tony and Dr. Clark. Welcome. Good morning, good morning. Good morning.
Hello, Tony and Chris. Good morning, Dave. Mm -hmm. Good morning. I hope you're all wound up for today. It might be a short show. It could be a long one. Who knows? No, oh, it'll be just right. Hmm. Tony was whining a little bit about it being too cold in Georgia this morning. So uh, I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted you in Edmonton to... Uh, Help Let them know see what the things temperature is here. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it's uh, minus twelve this morning. Wow! Which in uh, Fahrenheit is about uh, about minus eight of Fahrenheit. So that's feels like minus that's twelve. Way below thirty-two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Fortunately. It, you know, for those who think it's really cold up here in Edmonton, it's actually quite dry up here. It's almost like a winter desert. So the cold doesn't penetrate as much as it would on the coast. So people in Vancouver and people in the East Coast and uh, Newfoundland and Montreal and that sort of places, they have really wet winters and it penetrates you. It doesn't matter how many layers of clothing you put on, you're still cold. But out here, I can put on my parka and stand in 40 below and wait for a bus and it's not that difficult. But you have to dress for the occasion like you would for hot weather. And I don't think I could live in Georgia. I understand it's quite humid and hot. So. Yes, it's, it is quite hot here from time to time. Um, actually, I celebrated being in Georgia 40 years on November 1st. So when I got off the plane from New Jersey, came to Georgia to go to college, I got off the plane, I had on a full length leather coat, a sweater, boots. As you would, and, and that's New Jersey, yeah. And it was only uh, 82 degrees in Atlanta. <laughs> well, I, you know, you know, I just went to Japan and I expected it to be cooler, uh, somewhere around, you know, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, the whole time we were there, it was uh, plus 23 to 25 uh, Celsius, which is summer weather for me. And I'm walking around in shirt sleeves and everybody else is wearing a coat. So it's sort of how you adapt to those environments. Welcome to Education Hour. When I was starting out in my career, there was a big noise about media manipulation, subliminal images, violence on TV, and a rising concern around video games. Across the industrialized world, from Australia to Canada and into Europe, and in many places in the U.S., groups sprang up to promote efforts to educate people about media and the manipulation in the areas of advertising and controlling video games, and which at the time were gobbling up kids' quarters in gaming parlors playing Pac-Man. The first efforts tried to focus on influence and the undue access to children's programming carrying commercial messages for toys and snacks. And it was thought children could be protected from this influence if they understood these methods of persuasion. In Canada, a group formed to publish a counterculture magazine called Adbusters, uh, which I have a copy right here. Um, published it for about 10 years, and it claimed to be a journal of the mental health environment, and its content was meant to shake people out of their apathy toward this manipulation, and it was filled with, you know, provocative images, uh, 
and things to make people realize the manipulation they're going over. Their critiques, unfortunately, were closely tied to criticism of capitalism and not so much, you know, the mental environment they claimed. And it also had anarchistic leanings and a limited circulation, but it was one of many initiatives trying to bring these social debates forward. When, uh, when Wired magazine started up with the notion of explaining the cultural impact of our new technologies and platforms, uh, they did it in a more general sense. Many of today's tech luminaries wrote for Wired magazine in the 90s. Then there was the San Francisco-based Center for Media Literacy, which was formed to develop resources for educators to incorporate media analysis into their everyday classes. A lot of the early work was around depictions of violence, because that was the popular problem at the time, and that young people were presumably becoming violent from watching violence on television. And of course, that turns out not to be true, but this organization actually operates still today and is still providing um, teachers and educators with resources and uh, training to continue the media literacy effort. In 1992, a uh, definition of media literacy between all these organizations was agreed on, and I can tell you that was quite a debate. It states that media literacy is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and create media in different forms. Well, there's many variations on that particular definition, but uh, uh, the newest ones, of course, want to include the word internet somewhere in there. In South Korea, we hear that children are only permitted to play video games for about two hours a day. And parents are actually given fines if someone reported that their child was allowed to play video games for longer than those two hours. And we've been blaming media for society's ill since there were comic books. The fear is misplaced for sure, but no one can deny how the world changes with the introduction of each new technology from the way central heating changed clothing design or transistors and microchips have changed the way we do everything. And uh, now people are staring at their phones for most of the day. So each technology comes with an environment we enter into as a result of our reliance on that particular technology like microwave ovens. While driving my son and two friends home from a birthday party uh, when they were in primary school, one said they hoped that one day there'd be something like a, a watch on his wrist, which would contain everything he had to know, and he wouldn't have to go to school. Sounds normal. The other two were mumbling some sort of agreement, but they were pretty silent because they were tired from their party. And I waited through that long silence before I asked them, so how will you know if the information is correct? And that question remains with me, as media literacy training, has it had any effect? And is school the right place for media training? Are we ready to call time out on trying to analyze, evaluate, or create media? Or should there be more of a push to bring critical thinking to the front of the class? So I'm going to open the discussion. Um, I don't see hands up on our question panel yet. So let's go to the first question out there. First question from Tommy Shantz, St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm moving to Keynote from PowerPoint. What are a few tips or resources to take advantage of its strong points? Well, our local expert is John Snyder, so let's see what he has to say about it. I think you'll find that the general principles for communicating effectively are the same no matter which tool you use. And from a media literacy perspective, you should keep that in mind when you're making your slide deck. From a practical perspective, one of the couple things to watch out for is a lot of the functionality is in reverse order. And I kind of feel like PowerPoint and Keynote just do that to um, make their product look different. An example is your transitions tab. In PowerPoint, you do it on the second slide in a transition. And in Keynote, you do it on the first slide or vice versa. I forget. I always have to figure it out when I open up a new, new tool. Uh, make sure you customize your toolbar. Uh, that's something that will help you in Keynote. And learn things like cropping in Keynote is called masking, and your Boolean tools are in the Format tab. And generally speaking, in Keynote, your drop-down menus have a lot more features. Um, so those are some tools for switching. All right. Thanks for that, John. Um, I'm, I'm not using Keynote as much as I used to, but I loved it when I did use it. And the features that are in it are very powerful and, and actually very quick. You can get things done real fast in Keynote. I find PowerPoint a little more ponderous and too many drop-down menus and things. Uh, Chris Clark has got an opinion here. My thought is about managing your own transition between 
two systems that are largely similar but importantly different <laughs> from the user point of view. And my advice is that to think of it as similar to um, switching from a manual transmission to an automatic transmission or vice versa in your in your driving. Um, the way the only way to really move toward muscle memory is by using it. So try to jump right in and do a slide deck in Keynote and you'll run into the ways in which it's different from your habits that you developed as a PowerPoint uh, power user, perhaps. And uh, as as you try to manipulate slides or introduce animation or embed video or whatever you might want to do, you'll you'll struggle a bit, but eventually by doing it and getting the feedback from the the software that this isn't going to work or you're going to have to search around for this function or it has a different name than it had in PowerPoint, you'll eventually be able to internalize um, and use it comfortably. All right. Thanks for that. We'll take the next question. Next question looks to be from a familiar name here, Dave Troutman, Edmonton. Is the new media literacy focused on dealing with the collecting of personal data and intrusion into our private information? Uh, we'll start with John Snyder and then maybe I'll comment. I'm thinking, I wonder if the future of media will create a class of those who are able to pay to avoid ads and those who are not. And so we create two different databases, essentially, where the privileged few uh, don't get tracked and everyone else does. Uh, maybe not. Maybe no one will think anything's worth anything and they'll just be tracked because they're willing to give up their private data for the sake of uh, free stuff. Yeah, I kind of go with that myself, actually. That's a it's a second class, first class kind of distribution there. Uh, Tony? Yeah, I, I just would. I would just push back to your initial statements, Dave, in terms of the marketing component of it. I, th I think that that's where everything is really sort of pushed because the the idea of getting personal data for the sake of getting personal data is really, really not that exclusive, I think. I think it's more about what can be sold to you? What are the things that you're interested in? How can we market different products to you so that we can continue to um, put things in place so that you will con continue to spend your money? So I think that it's more about that than more so even about the, the privacy. The privacy is, is a byproduct of them being able to sell different items to you. Thanks for that. Uh, Mark Giuliani. So I think it's interesting because in the analog world, the communication was really one direction. You had a broadcaster, whether it be video or radio, radio sending yeah. that message out, but not really knowing what was coming back. And now that it's digital, we, the consumer, don't know all the time what is going back. And that enables all the big companies to really target who they're sending their message to, and it becomes much more involved in metadata and just the capturing of all of these statistics. Thanks. Uh, there are two things about this, I guess. We used to consider some of our information quite public. Uh, you had a phone book and your number was in it and your address and your name. And if you paid a special fee, of course, you could have your number not listed. And that's a quarter, you know, the same two class system as it were, if you're willing to pay not to be in the phone book. But we all, we all accepted that advertising and marketing agencies could put things in our mailboxes and, and that would be all right. And we would choose whether or not to respond. But I think in talking to young people myself uh, about their use of their phones or their tablets or even their laptops, that they're, they're not concerned about it. And I go back to when I was, put, you know, beginning in my career, I wasn't concerned that somebody could look up my phone number and give me a call and try and sell me something or put something in my mailbox to appeal to me. It, it wasn't bothersome. But now the intrusion is actually hidden and 
you don't know that somebody's collecting information and then parking things in your field of view uh, without you even being aware that that mechanism's operating. And the side that connects to media literacy is is whether or not an effort to try and educate people about you know, how to protect your personal information, how to be safe on the internet, how not to be doxxed, uh, how, how you know, fearsome we should be or how confident we should be on the internet and whether there are safe places uh, in order to do uh, two-way communication. Uh, some people actually have made their living uh, presenting to uh, students and to faculty uh, how to tell young people about being safe on the internet. Um, the intrusion into private information, I think, is still emerging, and I'm not sure it's a media literacy concern, but teaching people the mechanism of how that is stored, what it's for, and how vast it is. I think one of the things a lot of my family don't realize is they're, they're okay with giving their information to Facebook, but they forgot that there's a hundred other companies using that information. And they sometimes come to me and say, why am I getting these things about something or other? And I'm having to do a little media literacy about how, well, when you signed up for this and then you told them about you're doing that, uh, they connected the dots and now they're trying to sell you tickets to this, this show that's coming to town because you showed an interest in some relatively similar thing. John, you want to come back? Yeah, Dave, you said something about um, we were we used to talk about how to keep kids safe on the Internet. And I think we all interpret that as a society basically as don't talk to strangers because they'll try to kidnap you in real life. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if safety on the Internet today should mean something different than fearing for someone's physical safety. Absolutely, yes. And that is a big concern, especially in marginal communities, uh, being um, trivialized or, or attacked or um, interrupted with um, messages that are d quite terrible um, is a big problem. And in terms of showing people that there, there are ways to protect yourself or ways to make sure that this doesn't have an impact on you, um, are the new educators' obligations. And I think even... You know, schools aren't always, this is traditionally true, schools aren't always up to date with what's going on in society. And they're busy developing curriculum for years before they can use it in the schools properly and have everyone trained up. So we may be just a little behind the curve and that maybe when the new teachers emerge from college, they'll have those skills. They'll understand how platforms operate and how data is gathered and re reconverted into profiles. And then they'll be able to speak knowledgeably to students younger than them going up with, you know, phones in their hands. All right, let's move to the next question. Next question is Nathan Cash in Oregon City. Have you experimented with alternative aspect ratios for online presentations? For example, Felipe on Inside the Show uses four to five ratio slides that he shows next to him. Perhaps nine by 16 slides made for stories? I'll start with John Snyder. I would argue that Felipe still uses 9 by 16. He just puts his camera next to the slides. So his aspect ratio is still 9 by 16. I don't typically change the aspect ratio uh, because even though I have the ability to do things like a super source, I'm often making slide decks that other people also need to be using. And so they will be presenting it in a way that they can. And so I make sure that they can use it. Yeah, I'll just add to that in that when I'm presenting uh, slides, I make sure I'm making them for the projector or playback system that I'm going to encounter. So sometimes I'm asked to lecture at a university and I'm going to put a VGA signal into some projector. I don't know how old it's going to be. And so I have two versions usually. If I know the, the thing can handle high definition or widescreen, then I switch to that presentation. But I have a clone of it, which is a smaller uh, format. And that accommodates a less powerful, maybe uh, older projector environment, which is not going to be able to do the widescreen. Um, I didn't see what Felipe did, so I can't comment. But I think uh, experimenting with ratios and uh, working out layouts for widescreen that can then conform to a small screen is actually a good exercise. And, and you should try uh, doing both and seeing how they play and how readable they are. Our next question. Next question from John Snyder here on the panel, Reno, Nevada. Is media literacy different from country to country? 
I'll start on that one by saying that in my interactions with media literacy instructors and developers, uh, there was a huge effort in in Israel to educate everybody about um, misinformation. And this was in the late 80s and early 90s. So they were very concerned that citizens were being exposed to other TV channels and other sources of information that were telling untruths about things Israel was doing or what the government was up to and that sort of stuff. And they made an effort trying to make everybody, not just school children, but everybody in the whole population more aware of how these manipulations operate. Um, and I also know that um, in France, there was an initiative uh, for a long time, but also in Australia. The, it was a little different in Australia because they wanted to have people aware that if you're going to be watching Asian television from outside Australia, you're going to get a different sense of what Australia is than if you watch what's presented on Australian television, ABC and the rest. Um, so it was a, I guess it's a defensive effort. And in Canada, we had our Canadian content rules uh, that said, if we're going to watch all these American channels on our cable system, we needed to have channels that were equivalent in Canada. And it was... Um, mandated, uh, certainly in the radio business, that Canadian music be played right alongside any other music from wherever else. I don't have much experience either with Africa yet, but I have had some contact with people there. And because there are a number of different languages in, in Africa, uh, there's sort of a self-protection there that people tune into the ones that they're familiar with and are aware of the kind of uh, um, advertising and manipulation that's done on those. Tony, you've got a remark? I was, I was fortunate enough to have a conversation on Wednesday night with Mr. Ed Bice, who is the CEO of uh, Maiden. And um, during that conversation, uh, and for those who don't know, Maiden is a, a global nonprofit that investigates fact checking across the world, and they are, they are very good at what they do. Um, one of the things that occurred during that conversation was uh, a mention of Nobel Peace Prize winning uh, journalist uh, Maria Rissa. And um, I didn't know a lot about her other than her winning the Nobel Prize. And um, after that conversation, I was able to, to watch a, a PBS um, show that basically uh, talked about her journey and the things that she was going through in uh, the Philippines. And so it, it's very explicit in terms of explaining the things that she went through in terms of trying to uh, share the truth and get past all of the things that were um, what the populace was being directed, how they were being shaped, how they were being pushed, how they were encouraged to vote. And it was not in the things, the media was being manipulated in a way that it was not in their best interest. And the only reason that I, I, I bring it up as part of this conversation is that I think it's important for us to understand that we should not accept just general media at all because the view of what is marketed to us in terms of media is not always what things really are and so i would encourage all of us to be more mindful of the media uh, consumption that we digest and that make sure that we are pulling in information from a variety of different sources that are not necessarily associated or connected so that we have a varied view that may be beneficial. And so I thought it was important to mention that. And um, you can see in her story how difficult um, her journey was in order to push the truth of what you know, her, her life was in danger mm -hmm. and it, it's mm -hmm. very clear. And, that, um, 
And I think it's important for um, us to be thinking about those kinds of things, particularly worldwide when we get information and it's not always in our best interest and it's targeted in a certain kind of way. And uh, I, I just want to also mention that our own Mickey Mechature was the, the sound guy for for her um, for her story being shared. Mm-hmm. I, I was aware of her actually, and I was monitoring her pretty closely, probably from something I saw in the Guardian in the UK. Um, Chris, you have a comment. I just wanted to get back to uh, John Snyder's original question, and the answer is yes. John, it's different in, in every country and culture. And as we've heard from the several who've responded to your question, one of the huge differences is that in different countries, media literacy or the lack of it can be a life or death matter for some people. Whereas um, I don't think that's quite the case yet in North America. But it, it, I may be missing part of the picture there. But um, but it's kind of obvious that in in places like uh, the Philippines, um, it can be a life or death matter. Thanks, Chris. Uh, personally, I've I've sort of always been uh, because of my work with the Defense Department. Uh, I'm quite aware of how the military operates and what its contingencies are and how they think about the world. And when I was watching some news years ago about the uh, arrival of U.S. troops in Somalia, uh, I was watching CNN footage of these rangers coming off boats in the water and arriving at a beach. And for some reason, the cameraman knew where they were going to be. And I turned to my wife and said, that's the stage piece. They've been on the shore now for more than a week. This is where they want the, the other side to know where they are and to think that they've just arrived. But in fact, the military have been, you know, the Rangers have been secretly inside Somalia now for a week. And the same was with uh, Kuwait and other things like that. So anytime there's an international conflict, uh, we have to understand that the, both sides are going to be telling a different story and each side is leaving out information that would clarify whether or not what you're listening to is actually true. There's an image or a control of the narrative which is now, since Vietnam, essential to the success or failure of conflict, uh, that they manage the message as much as they manage their troops on the field. And a consideration for how the public is going to perceive this is a big deal. I'm personally not sure how many people below 20 are even paying attention or care that these messages are highly manipulated and carefully manufactured. So yes, in some areas of the world where it's peaceful, it's a dispute between you and the advertisers or the promoters of products. But in some other critical areas of the world, it's, it's again, a life and death situation, like Chris said. We'll move to the next question. Next question from James Fullen, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Our Google was upgraded to Education Plus, adding collaborative tools to Meet along with streaming. How do you learn about these collaboration tools without a ready set group to test with? That's an interesting question, too, because I just came out of uh, a couple of months ago, I came out of a seminar where a fellow in our city was familiar with this whole process of the collaboration tools, how to work with streaming, and how to manage all the special add-ons that Google has put in for both uh, the Education Plus, but also for nonprofit groups. And I was quite amazed at how integrated the whole thing is. Uh, and I found it fairly easy to follow what he was saying. So as someone who's used lots of these tools in the past, seeing how they're connected together is actually very helpful. Uh, I would just I, I imagine Google itself uh, has lists of regions where um, support can be found for learning more about this or places where you can go on YouTube where somebody walks you through it for 30 minutes and uh, has screenshots and the rest like I saw. Chris? I think this is an opportunity for a commercial for after hours. <laughs> James, our James Fosslein might um, tune into after hours and I'll bet smart people would show up and be very helpful. Yes. 
Yeah, there's a lot of good users and people who use them in their uh, industrial work. So, um, yeah, if you spend a little time in after hours and keep asking if anybody can explain how Google Education is working, uh, that'd be great. Yeah. All right. Next question. Next question from Douglas Carmichael. In times of crisis or emergency, whose responsibility should it be to police misinformation online? Should it be governments, platform operators, or both? That's a tricky one because who is responsible for misinformation? You'd have to be able to identify a source of it. Then you'd have to determine whether or not you have any laws that govern control of that information. A lot of misinformation is presented as opinion and phrases like people say, well, we don't identify the people and we don't identify the authenticity of what they said. And so we can't verify um, who should be responsible. Platform operators are under the gun now for some of their lackadaisical approach to it, letting people decide for themselves what's working and what's not and what they'll put up with. We all say that, you know, when you didn't like what was on TV, you could always reach over and turn it off. It's really hard to get off the Internet if everything you're doing is on the Internet, considering you're searching for work, you're doing your banking, you're communicating with other people casually and formally, and the platform operators can't distinguish between those kind of uses of their platforms and the misuse of their platforms. So we're still emerging like we were in the Wild West, we're still making laws that fit the conditions and the circumstances. It's not government's job to tell us how to behave, and there's no, I haven't yet heard of a law that controls my behavior. Uh, and many who try to put laws in to control people's behavior fail because policy-wise, it's not a good idea. Crisis and emergency, of course, is a category of, you know, extreme circumstances uh, requiring quick action and, and useful information and say an earthquake or whatever. And if there is misinformation, you have to wonder if it's coming from outside that region in an effort to destabilize that region. And I would be suspect of any information I was getting, even from what we consider to be trusted sources in the short periods immediately following a crisis or emergency. But after you're in the emergency for maybe more than a day, it might be easier to sort of separate out those who are giving us the wrong story and those who are still trying to present the real story. Because a real story doesn't always emerge immediately. It takes a while to get to what's really going on. Mark? I think that's well said. And I think this ties in a little bit to the last question where we talked, or two questions ago, where we talked about, is it different in different countries? If you have state-run media, then the state-run media is part of the police. So that take, kind of takes care of itself in one way. Uh, but you always have to ask and verify. You can't really trust any of the sources. And, and, and a lot of this has changed, really, with the advent of cable TV. Because when you had the three networks in an analog environment, they really were just about news. Here's the news. We're going to tell you. You decide what you want to about it and do more research on it. Today, it seems like everything. everyone's got an opinion. Even the news has an opinion. So it makes it much more difficult to, to do the research and figure out. And, you know, you almost have to put one network side by side against another network. And somewhere in the middle, there might be the truth. Yes. And, it, and the effort uh, used to be done by other people to get paid for it. Now we're, it's been downloaded to us. We are responsible for determining our own information and the sources we're choosing to trust. And at some point, I mean, in, in some cases, I've had uh, authors um, that I followed for a long time in 2008, 9, and 10. And then somewhere around 2017, they seem to have lost their mind. And I, I can't understand what they're talking about anymore. And so I don't, I don't follow them. And it's just like that. It's where we used to have people who were either embedded in the business or the, the sector they were covering. And they'd tell us about science and we could trust what they said because it went through editors and other people to verify it. Um, and there were whole staffs in, in some of the stations that I know of that were there to verify everything that someone was going to write or say or put on their shows. Uh, now it's a free-for-all because I can I could today tell you things that aren't true and uh, you'd have to come back to me to say, where'd you get that from and all the rest. And I might not even have uh, an access point for you to be able to get in touch with me. So, Chris, you've got a point on this? 
Well, the previous speakers have said so much that's right and helpful. Um, one other thought is that, um, in a sense, media literacy is is helping uh, all of us uh, manage what used, as as Dave just said, manage what used to be managed farther up the line um, by television networks and radio networks, for example. Um, so media literacy is a kind of uh, self-help program in a way. It, it helps mm -hmm. me uh, be uh, sort of affirmatively skeptical, if that's not a complete contradiction, and, and also sort out the difference between uh, information that I actually need to act on compared with information that I'm curious about or morbidly curious about, or I want to know what the latest is on the disaster in off Fuku mm -hmm. Fukushima in Japan. Well, I don't, I don't have any stake in the conditions on the ground in Japan personally. Mm -hmm. So my obsession with following the latest development in Fukushima after an earthquake, um, is optional. It should be optional. And I should have a little help in closing the blinds when when that when I'm pursuing that as a and it, and it moves toward the level of obsession and anxiety. So it's a self care process where for some great majority, perhaps, of news, quote, unquote, um, I, sh I should have a set of yoga exercises that will help me close the blind or change mm. the channel or. Mm. Well, uh, this is where the term doom scrolling comes from is, uh, you know, in the early 2020s when the pandemic was going, all people could do is sit at home and try and get more information all day long. Yeah. And uh, that's well said. And I think we need an, an antidote uh, to doom scrolling, a way of, uh, managing that compulsion that has become uh, somewhat habitual, as you point out, in the last two years, especially. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm looking for as a component of media literacy is uh, constructive self management. Thank you, Mark. So it's interesting what you said, Dave, about the layers and layers we used to have that the news would have to go through before it came out for any kind of information. And yeah, that's with, a disinter, a disintermediation that Leo is always talking about. You know? Right. And part of the part of the challenge here for the media companies is that there's so many more platforms now and the advertisers have so many more places to put their advertising that the traditional media their budgets are just getting, you know, shredded. Clobbered. Be yeah. Because there's less and less advertising dollars coming in, which means you're getting layers and layers kind of moved out. And so it's more and more important for people to just listen, but question what, where is this coming from and, and what is the meaning of it? Because you've got to compete now with just all these different layers of information. Not to be too historical, but when there were just the three channels, I used to notice that on the weekend news, it was pretty thin news usually on a weekend. And so they would let the newcomers or the, the, uh, what do they call them? The, the, Mm, I, I lose the word now, but there there are people who are just interns. entering into journalism. Interns, thank you very much. And they would take over writing some of the stories for the weekend. And you could tell that it was done by an amateur because they never bothered to investigate that deeply or draw on interview sources and all the rest. And, and I used to sort of smile and say, well, you know, they're learning how to do it. And it is the weekend, so maybe nothing is happening. Uh, but now, with as you say, with 24-hour news, uh, the sense of urgency and the sense of um, alarm that is having to be invoked in all these channels and all these sources, including the, the digital sources and some of the blogs, people are just saying it's an outrage or it's got to be dealt with right now or whatever. And we're not getting the deep information as to why and how and who. We're just getting told that this is important and I think you should be yelling about it. There's a protest sign I have, I think, on my computer here about, you know, 
I don't know what we're all yelling about is the protest sign, but I'm here. So let's move to the next question. Sure. The next question is from Chad Lafarge in Columbia, Missouri. Are there tools available to identify bias in various sources? How about tools to facilitate enforcing our right to be forgotten? John Snyder. I remember seeing it was like one to two years ago. There was a website that I think it was some university um, research group put together and what it would allow you to do. And so if anyone knows what it is, please put it in the chat because I, I want to find it again. But you, it was a news website. And on the bottom of the site, there were sliders and you could slide how conservative or liberal you were or your religion or um, your gender. And you could just move sliders and see the news stories that the algorithm populated and how your changes and what the computer thought of you impacted what you were offered. And I feel like that's the kind of tool that if we can get in front of students, can help them put their wrap their mind around the amount of impact and influence that occurs when viewing something that you, when you do something as simple as a Google search or open up a newsfeed. And I don't remember where it was, but I wish I could find it again. Yeah, that would be nice to know about. I have a newsfeed I have where, I'm gonna block on the name of it, but where it actually tells you where the balance is in each of the stories from their different sources. So they'll have a story headline and then eight or nine sources, including Al Jazeera and all the rest, and then when you bring up that, it tells you whether it's leaning left or right in its larger interpretation. I don't know where they're getting the data from, and maybe I should inquire to the person who developed the app just where it is they're getting their stuff from. Uh, we'll go to the next question. Craig McFarlane, Boston, Massachusetts. Choices on privacy are based on what could happen. Isn't there an awareness gap of dark patterns company used to manipulate? Dan Ari Lee's book, Predictably Irrational, comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Having not read Dan's book, I'm not going to comment on that, but the awareness of dark patterns, uh, it comes back to the first rule in advertising that I was taught, is to eradicate what a person thinks they already know and replace it with my message. And that's very effective, and it is a manipulation. It's saying, you know, you thought you understood where headaches come from, but until you know what we're doing about headaches, you should buy our pill. And it just tells you that you shouldn't trust what you already know. And that, in advertising, is a repeated, constant message, and it, it permeates almost everything from billboards to newspapers to radio to television and now on the Internet, telling us, you know, you won't believe what your doctor won't tell you about this. And I'm going, okay, the fact that you're telling me that I'm being uh, held back from information is is the first clue that what you're about to tell me is trying to persuade me about something. And that's the first clue in media literacy that the message is likely suspect because they're trying to persuade you. And it's like the music man. He's trying to persuade you to buy musical instruments while he's going to make like it's the most important thing in the world. But he's also going to try and tell you that what you didn't like about playing music is wrong. And now I'm going to tell you why that's the greatest thing in the world. So I hope that helps with your question. We'll go to the next one. Next question from Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana. If we teach students how to tell their own stories with media, will they learn how montage edits are used to influence them? And is it how the story is told or just the fact that the subject itself is chosen that is manipulative? Let's start with John. We often talk about how you can use project-based learning or use assignments that the student builds or creates to reinforce learning. And I feel like this is an excellent opportunity to demonstrate that by having the, the students create a montage, they hopefully will evaluate the sources they're using as well as I think it might be a really good idea to say, um, especially for approximately like late high school students, give us one montage and then build it again from a different perspective using the same sources. And so they themselves can actually be the manipulators to see how you can take the exact same footage from the exact same time and maybe put a different musical background on it or uh, just change where you make your cuts to show you can tell two stories with the same information. That's terrific. Yes. Chris? I agree with what John said. It's a great question, Roscoe. Um, When I hear the words media literacy, I think about reading, of course, reading and writing. And uh, 
often we, we neglect the writing part of reading and writing in schooling. Um, and in a sense, making, uh, telling your own story with media is a lot more like writing than being receptive, reading, just interpreting uh, information that comes to you through media and then um, deciding whether it's credible or not or whether it's worthy of action or not or changing your mind or not. So I, I completely agree with Roscoe's idea that making, uh, seeing the back end of media in a more sophisticated way by actually trying to make representations of uh, ideas or news that um, can appear to be persuasive and yet uh, different from reality. And your earlier example, Dave, or of a film of troops landing on the beach in Somalia uh, are, you know, realistic portrayals of something that happened, but not necessarily in the uh, sequence or in the order mm -hmm. that that's being represented as. Uh, and meant to sure. distract you. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think absolutely uh, Roscoe's on target with uh, a way to understand media and what it's capable of representing uh, persuasively is to actually engage students and probably even younger than, than high school um, mm -hmm. as, as Alex's experience with, um, with his long-term pixel core. Mm -hmm. project indicated those were younger students um yeah and it was surprising to him what what they were capable of once they understood um once they had a chance to play with um projects and actually make things that they could experimentally try out on their peers and and find well yeah some things are you can mislead people even people who who know you well, know what you're up to. So I, I'm reminded of a project in an elementary school. Uh, grade three students were all given Polaroid cameras for a day. And their assignment was to just represent what it's like to be at school. And they spent a good long time running around the school taking pictures. But when you saw all the pictures they took, it was a completely different school from what you and I would see. And they thought these things were school. And it just it, it gave them a chance to represent their school to themselves in a way that was unexpected by the teachers. And some of those pictures were just amazing because they were taken from a perspective that we don't usually consider when you design a school or set up a curriculum and all the rest. What a person sitting in the desk actually experiences is uh, sometimes invisible until they show us that. Tony? I guess I need to start out by saying because I'm an old guy, I have this perspective. I, uh, when I, uh, my last year of high school, 1976, was the country's bicentennial. And part of uh, the school that I went to was project-based school. And one of the projects was that we had to participate in the bicentennial debates. And one of the, the things that we were required to do was this was a, um, a statewide competition. And so there was documentation that we had to study and we had to be prepared to be either pro or con. And we would never know which one we would be until the actual debate. So right. we had to prepare and study and get all of the information for both sides. Mm -hmm. And what I would say in terms of young people telling their stories I think that that is the way in which you get a holistic view of being able to tell a story where you have the opportunity to get both sides and then make a decision based on having the information from both sides to move forward. And I think mm -hmm. that that informs your story. But um, if you're only getting one side, you never have the complete story. Uh, to go back to Roscoe and his question about whether, you know, learning to do montage edits and that actually helps you see what other people are using media for. I, I think that's a really important thing because 
for me, there's some evidence that without media literacy training, many young people today un actually understand how they're being manipulated. And they often demonstrate this in their YouTube videos or TikTok or other areas that they're digitalized, where they're playful with it. They know what the joke is. They know what people are trying to persuade them of, and then they, they flip it. They turn it into something that's entertaining. So for me, there's some hope and evidence that, that people who've been born into the world where the internet is normal, that platforms are ubiquitous and they've adapted and adjust their messages and their own interpretation of real life uh, to entertain us on YouTube. So I like that. We'll move on to the next question. Next question from Julian Maynold, Dortmund, Germany. I always tell my students that they need to be comfortable to share everything that is on their devices. Otherwise, it shouldn't be on it. What are better and more practical ways to protect them from data abuse? We'll start with Chris. I just have a sh one short contribution, which is uh, don't take your cell phone to bed. <laughs> That's a good suggestion. Yes, keep it out of the bedroom. Nobody's going to pick it up and use it. Um, practical ways to protect them from data abuse. Well, uh, I was told very early, actually, when I was first forced to work with a computer at, at a job, um, don't put anything on there you wouldn't want to defend in a courtroom. And that served me really well in terms of proofreading my emails and keeping things short and not keeping stuff on my machine that is not safe for work or any of those things. And when I became a supervisor of other people who work with graphics and animation and all the rest, I would pass that on to them, that if the corporation was ever sued for anything, they'd be looking at everything that's on the machines and seeing if it can uh, bring down our reputation and enhance their, their claims. So... Um, for protecting yourself from data abuse is to s assume that everything you put on the internet can be used against you. That's that's about as simple as I can put it. Uh, if I put a jokey picture of myself posing strangely with someone I've never met, uh, somebody can put somebody else's face in there, somebody else can make it look like I'm in a different place than I would normally go. Uh, we see this quite a lot now with the fear of um, um, the... Um, faking faking videos uh, what do they call those anyway uh, the, the the videos that that put somebody else's uh, face on a, deep on a fakes. performance deep fakes thank you very much Harshid. Th this deep fake thing is actually now again engendering distrust in all the messages we're getting and the lack of trust in our messages seems to be just cascading it started with a little bit and now it's more and now we're at the point where we can't actually trust that which we're seeing now if it's live like a football game or whatever it's unlikely somebody's manipulating the outcome or the score but when it comes to pre-prepared stuff yeah it's it's probably a, a case of just saying to protect yourself assume everything will be used against you mark but it's not only the things that might be used against you it's it's simple things like if i share my phone number with someone on the panel and it goes into their contacts in their phone I've shared it with them, and that's perfectly understandable that that's where they would store it. But if that person then downloads an app, unbeknownst to them, that that app is going in and stealing all those contacts and then using them to send out emails, that how do you protect against that? And that's you, you just really have to make sure you trust the apps that you're downloading um, because there's no real way to gauge it other than that and hope that what's on the Apple store or whatever other store you're getting your products from they're just not being misused or misrepresented. Yeah, yeah. Big point there, because we have, again, been downloaded to investigate our own safety standards with anything that comes across our desk as uh, the latest, greatest new thing. Yeah. Next question. Next question is from David Brady, New York, New York. Is the history of the medium still relevant in today's media landscape? My mentor taught me to understand the basics and everything else will fall into place. With the influencer generation, it seems people want instant success without the struggle. I agree. You you can't ignore the history of medium um, in a media landscape. Um, when I'm teaching media literacy to anybody or presenting to teachers or parents who are concerned about their kids playing too many video games, 
I tell them, you know, that you immerse yourselves in a lot of different things. Would you be concerned if your child was uh, riding a motocross bike for eight hours a day? And they'd say, no, he's outdoors, he's doing fun things. And, you know, and then you think, well, if he's obsessed with motocross, how would you know? And sometimes what comes out of playing video games is actually kind of positive. So, yeah, the influencer generation want instant success, but I think that's sort of a, a brain thing right now for seeking an audience because you can't have real relationships in real life as much as we had opportunities before. So the environment for social interaction has shrunk and the sense of community has been broken up, excuse me, broken up uh, by other factors such as uh, materialism and, and uh, individualism and all the rest. And uh, the media landscape is sort of broken up at the same time. And so the basics are becoming invisible and influencers are feeling like if I don't have my audience, I'm not relevant, which is the same flawed logic as if I don't have a job, I'm not relevant. Or if I'm not included in society, then I'm not relevant. So yeah, that's a good one. Next question. Next question, Douglas Carmichael. Do you think that teaching media production skills as part of the curriculum will make students more media literate in their own lives? I guess for me, it's the start. It's where you start, is you show them you can do this too, and then it empowers them. John? It can. It will not happen by itself without effort. And what I mean by that is you can just as easily teach someone how to flick switches when told without them actually evaluating or incorporating that into their larger knowledge set. And how I would do that is I would make sure to include things like reflection as well as application when I was designing my curriculum to ensure that we're thinking beyond just the task and into the why as well as how does this apply elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Next question from Brody Hefner in New York City. Do any of the countries devoting extensive resources to media literacy education report data evaluating the effectiveness of their programs? Personally, I know that Australia does. They have a whole institute in uh, Wollongong University, I believe, uh, who study whether or not media literacy education is working. There's also a site called uh, No Significant Difference, which actually dates back to the 60s. All the research has been done, and this is official research by real researchers in many institutions, uh, looking at whether teaching through media was effective. And uh, they've discovered that no matter what media you choose, uh, from print, through radio, through television, if you try and do a curriculum through it, there's no significant difference in whether the students uh, access that information and integrate it in their lives. John? Measuring learning outcomes is notoriously difficult, and it leads to all sorts of um, terrible programs as well. It's really challenging to do. Uh, there's a great book on this. Uh, specifically, there's a chapter on education and how metrics have impacted education in a book called The Tyranny of Metrics. I'll put in the chat. Thanks. And our last question. Rounding it out here, Douglas Carmichael. The EU Digital Services Act will require platform operators to address and remove disinformation on their platforms. Do you think this runs the risk of legitimately dissenting voices being ensnared in the disinformation net? That is the balance they're trying to strike is can you upload this to the people who are the platform operators and make them responsible for it? And it's almost like trying to reconstruct the editorial world that existed before the platforms were disintegrated. So I, I'm of the belief that that may be a mistake to try and push that back because then the resistance might be futile. Uh, Mark? Well, who's the... Who is to judge what the disinformation is? And this is why debate and conversation and communication are so important to keep the, to, to dig down into a topic and find out what truth is. And John. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better than Mark. If you think of a specific example, uh, one media outlet might say fallen Jedi murders hundreds and another might say revolutionary hero frees Jedi Academy from oppressors uh, when you're watching episode three. So just depends. Okay. I want to thank all the producers who contributed today. Uh, you made the discussion quite interesting. And uh, I'm really pleased that you all took an interest in it. 
uh, you make the show. And I hope you come back next Saturday and talk to us again. Uh, thanks also to the crew in the background. Without them, none of this operates. And they do yeoman service for us. And they're all volunteers. So we want to thank them personally and collectively. Uh, that's it for Education Hour today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Thanks to all you guys for chatting with me today. It was fun. Good show. Good, nice good job, Ronnie. Ronnie. Good job reading the questions. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank, for, you. Uh, thank you, Ronnie. Yeah, thanks thank you for again. having me. Trying good to get job. a little more comfortable here and um, still not happy with any of the audio stuff. But anyway. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, they said that you should call them because they have a lot of good stuff for you. What, say what? Sweetwater called me just uh, in the middle oh. of the They told me to call, <laughs> tell you to call them because they got a good, lot of good stuff for you. Now I'm starting to think that you, uh, that you're an influencer for uh, for your audio <laughs> interface there. Me? No. Yeah. Ronnie's media literacy is showing. There you go. I'm loving this mute uh, slide though. I, I, if 